for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Thompson. I'm the Seabock Canada Basketball Manager of Officials Development. Uh, I'd like to thank Rike and Gabby, who are both on the phone, that are looking after our technology tonight. Uh, we've got about 165 people online at the moment, and the number continues to grow. Um, this is the fourth in our series of webinars. A couple of things, if I may ask. If you haven't already, will you please mute your microphone? If you have any questions, please use the chat function, type them in. They should be visible to me. And at the end of Jack's session, I think we'll have some time for some questions and I'll throw it over to Jack. Uh, without further ado, if I can, I'd like to introduce the president of the Ontario Association of Basketball Officials, Mr. Rick Parnham, who has been responsible for arranging tonight's webinar. And Rick, I'll ask you to do an introduction of our special guest, if you will. Thanks, Mike. Uh, much appreciated there. Um, it's with great pleasure that we're able to introduce a, a well-known Canadian basketball voice and face. Uh, Jack has been part of the Raptors broadcast team for the past 22 years. Most remember Jack's voice on last, uh, last year's Game 6 Triumph. Um, always still exciting, and it was a great uh, one-year anniversary not too long ago, Jack, right, uh, that we were able to hear you again. Uh, his work as a commentator and analy analysis or, or analyst, sorry, is, uh, is not just for the Raptors, but Jack also does a lot of international and NC2A games. Jack was born to Irish immigrants and raised in Brooklyn. He uh, graduated from Fordham University with a master's in communication. He brings an extensive coaching background, having started being a high school coach at the age of 19. He then was an assistant at Fordham and moved to Niagara, where in his second year at Niagara was appointed at the ripe old age of 26 to become a Division I men's coach. He was there for nine years and then transitioned into broadcasting. Um, it was at Niagara where Jack met his lovely wife, Dina, um, who was the head women's soccer coach at Niagara at the time. They were married and are now adoptive parents to Kevin, Brian, and Tim all in their 20s. Uh, he and Dina continue to live in the Western New York area, just across the border in Lewiston, New York. And without further ado, I turn the evening over to Jack Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Rick. I, I really appreciate it. And, and folks, thanks for having me. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm honored and, and it's a privilege to be on uh, with, with each and every one of you. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's been a few years since I spoke at an officiating uh, clinic or officiating uh, event. Uh, a good friend of mine, Ron Foxcroft, had me speak at his a few different times. And uh, I've done a few others over the years uh, when I was a, a college coach. And uh, so I'm really, uh, I, I enjoy this. It's, it's, uh, it's a different thing. And, uh, I, and as Rick mentioned, uh, I've coached at all levels. Uh, not only was I a high school and college uh, head coach, but I was also, prior to that, uh, I coached in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. I coached CYO basketball, 7th, 8th grade basketball. At, as Rick mentioned, I was a high school coach at uh, Nazareth High School in Brooklyn. Uh, then I was an assistant at Fordham, and then assistant at Niagara, and then the head coach at Niagara. So I coached 14 years of NCAA Division I basketball, and uh, not only was my wife a uh, Division One head coach in, in women's soccer, uh, but she was also women's basketball assistant uh, at Niagara University. So she was an NCAA coach in two sports. Uh, so to me, uh, I, 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 I've lived it. Uh, my wife has lived it. Uh, and, and, and our kids have played sports. So uh, I kind of get the whole element of it. Uh, and, and on top of that, I... Uh, in my time with the Raptors, the last few years, the NBA's asked me to sit on the NBA officials advisory board. Uh, so I've gone to some meetings with that and, uh, you know, kind of taken part in that. And, and, and kind of my motto has always been when I speak, if I can say one thing that helps you, I've done my job. If I say more than one thing, uh, we'll, we've witnessed a miracle. So I'm going to do my best. To at least give you a one, uh, you know, and, and kind of my mentality is kind of food for thought, you know, where uh, 
to get to get you thinking about things and to get you to reflect on where you're at and and where you're going with this. And as we know, you know these seminars are are kind of set up because uh, you want to stay engaged. You you know you want to stay sharp. Uh, you want to keep improving. You want to keep growing. Uh, you want to expand your horizons. Uh, what's the Eagles song? Already gone. Sometimes you can see the star stars, but you can't see the light. Uh, and I think each time you jump on these calls, if you can see that light a little bit brighter uh, and you can see the bigger picture in terms of your development, your growth, your continued improvement as an official, then these things are an amazing opportunity to uh, stay sharp, stay engaged and keep getting better during a time where we all missing sports right now. So um, a bottle that uh, I use, and I, and I believe it applies to everything. Not only does it apply in officiating, but it, and, and I, I've brought this up uh, at the NBA Officials Advisory Committee uh, meetings. And I brought it up two years ago, and then last year, last year at our conference in Chicago, uh, one of the first things they started off the conference with was my quote. So I'm going to use it for you now, but it applies to business. It applies to uh, parenthood. It applies to everything, teaching, coaching, refereeing, everything in life. Rules without relationships equal rebellion. Let me repeat that. Rules without relationships equal rebellion. And we all know from a societal standpoint right now, you see that. We all experience that in different phases. And then part two of that, rules with relationships equal respect and results. Rules with relationships equal respect and results. So uh, most of you I haven't had the opportunity to, to meet before. Uh, I would kind of describe myself as a people person. Uh, people have asked me, do you miss uh, the NBA? Do you miss the Raptors right now? Yeah, I miss the game. I love the game. The game's my life. But I miss the people. I miss the interaction with uh, the vendors, the ticket takers, uh, the fans, the players, the refs, the coaches, the scouts, everybody involved. We're in the people business. And to me, this job that I have and the job that you have when you step in a gym, it's a celebration of people. It's a, a celebration of, of sport. And most importantly, it's a celebration of sportsmanship. And uh, to me, I, I think it's one of those things that I, I totally have empathy and respect for the job each and every one of you do. This is a tough job you have. And, you know, as a former coach, uh, I, I, I see it uh, talking to my coaching friends. Uh, I'm around coaches every day. I'm around uh, executive basketball executives every day, I'm around referees every day. It's tough to be an authority figure these days. I think authority figures are under siege. It's not an easy thing. Uh, people are after you constantly, you know, and, and it's one of those things where, uh, you know, you're, you're constantly uh, dealing with uh, people that have unreasonable expectations of you when you're out there just trying to do your best. And, you know, so I get that. It's a tough job. I think so much of it comes down to the first impressions. You know, and I always say to players, uh, I've said it to my own kids, first impressions are lasting. You don't get a second chance to make the right first impression. Every time you walk in that gym, the coach might be familiar with you on one team. The other one might not be. Players might be familiar with you, some not. There'll be people in the stands that have never seen you officiate before. You're on stage. This is your moment. Do you have the stage presence? And first impressions are lasting, and you don't get a second chance to make the right first impression. 
how you conduct yourself and how you walk in is a big, big thing. And to me, uh, I, I'm a big believer in the fact that I've said this many times uh, when I've been at these NBA seminars, and I've said it when I was a college coach. The two things I look for, actually more than two, but two things definitely when we talk about impressions uh, for an official to me is what's your stage presence? What kind of presence do you have on stage? You know, and, and I think that's a, an incredibly important thing. And secondly, what's your bedside man? You know, what is your, your, how do you carry yourself? What's your bedside manner? Are you approachable? Are people comfortable with you? Are they intimidated by you? Are you robotic in your movements? So bedside manner is important. And, you know, and stage presence. And obviously judgment and knowledge of the rules and all those things are, are obviously very, very important things. Uh, you know, to me, you know, your, your ability to judge, your ability to discern, your ability to make uh, rapid fire decisions is, is important. And we always say, you know, as a former coach, uh, there are a lot of elements of coaching. There are a lot of coaches that are terrific in practice. And then when the game gets live, their vision gets blurry. You know, and, and to me, uh, there is a big difference between being a peacetime general and a wartime general. You know, and, and uh, I'll never forget a good friend of mine, and Rick is a big Buffalo Bills fan, so he's going to know it right away when I say it. A good friend of mine is Bill Polian, who's in the NFL Hall of Fame. Uh, his boys all went to my basketball camp. Uh, his boys are all in the football business now. And Bill and I are very close, and Bill's a six-time NFL executive of the year. He put together the four Buffalo Bills Super Bowl teams. And he's an amazing guy. But I asked him one time, and I won't say the quarterback, but I asked him, I said, hey, the Bills drafted this quarterback. What do you think? He goes, doesn't have it. I said, why? He goes, slow eyes. I said, excuse me? He goes, slow eyes. Now, this is a guy that had Jim Kelly and Peyton Manning, to name a few. So I think he has an idea of, of it, who has it and who doesn't. And his thing was uh, to be great, you got to have, you got to be able to read and react, decipher and make rapid fire decisions. Peacetime general, wartime general, big difference. And I look at point guards, I look at quarterbacks. I look at the, the, your center on a power play. You know, it's like what they say about Wayne Gretzky. I, pa I, I pass the puck to where the, I want the, where the puck's going to be. I go to where the puck, excuse me, I go to where the puck is going to be, not where it was. You know, and, and just seeing things ahead. And I look at the best officials. Not only do they have stage presence, and bedside matter, and they know the rules, and they have good judgment, and they can discern, but they also have the ability to make rapid-fire decisions and make rapid-fire judgments and are cued in and, and ready and prepared when they step across that line to make that impression. They're ready. And to me, uh, the best ones have that. And I think those are a lot of the ingredients uh, that come with, it, you know, and, and it's so important. Uh, another thing, uh, I think there's a big difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Uh, I think too often when I see young officials, they go by the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. And my motto in life is common sense overrules the rules. Common sense overrules the rules. 
I think there needs to be more of your judgment and your personal ability to interpret in a rapid fire fashion the rules that you've been taught and, and be able to make good, solid, high percentage, not perfect, let me repeat that, not perfect, but high percentage decisions, uh, you know, risk assessments and, and make good assessments and good judgments in a rapid fire way. You know, and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make lots of mistakes. You know, 10% in life is what happens to you. 90% is how you deal with it. 10% is what happens to you. 90% is how you deal with it. You're going to kick calls. It's how you react to that call and getting back. I mean, like, hey, man, I've made a million lousy decisions as a coach. Guess what? That's why I got fired. Look at my career record. I was horrible. Okay, that's why I'm in television. This is the greatest scam going. What I do now for a living is sports version of a white-collar crime. This is truly the ultimate scam. So I've gone from being an idiot coach to now suddenly being an expert because they put a microphone in front of me on TV. It's a joke. But, hey, don't tell anybody. It's all a little secret on this, on this, on this little call that we're on. But what, what I look at is how do you bounce back from mistakes? You're going you're gonna to kick a call. You're going to kick a call. Players make mistakes. The good ones play through it. The good officials go through it. Coaches, you make a bad substitution. Uh, you, you, you call the wrong play. Uh, a lot of different things. And you, and you have to be able to push through and be able to, to keep going and stay, stay with it. Here's another one. When you're an official, just like a coach, you're, the minute you cross that line, your life's on red alert. And you'll, when I say this, you'll go, yep, I understand that. And, and I, I look back to my time as a coach, it was like this all the time. Here it is. Life is a series of problems. You're either dealing with one right now, you just dealt with one, or you're about to deal with one. You're either dealing with a problem right at this moment, you just dealt with a problem, or you got a problem coming your way momentarily. Red alert. And to me, when you show up in that gym, you got to be prepared for all those factors. It ain't easy. And I don't care what level you're at, you're going to have to deal with that. And to me, I think that's a big, big thing, you know, when you walk in that gym of, of how, you, how you do that. And, and I, I think it's important as well uh, to, to, to try to have that humanity when you walk in there. Uh, to walk over to the coach and say, hey, you know, my name is uh, Jim or my name's Mary. And I'm officiating your game tonight. Hey, look, I'm going to give it my best shot tonight. I just want you to know I'm imperfect. I'm going to give it my best shot. And your players are going to make mistakes. Coach, you might even make a mistake or two. And I just want you to know I'll probably make some. But I promise you, I'm going to give it everything I got tonight. And you walk down to the other coach. And you say the same thing. And I think when you disarm them early and let them know, hey, man, I'm going to bust my ass out here for you. I'm going to do everything I can. Right off the bat, you've kind of broken the couch down a little bit. Uh, to me, I think that's important. Uh, and it's not necessarily setting the ground rules. I think it's just showing your humanity and establishing a relationship. So during the game, if you do kick a call and you run by, you say, you know what? That's on me. My bad. 
You know, I, and I, I think it's really, and, and players get that. Coaches get that. And it might be a one-time thing where you'll, you'll, you'll never ref these, these people again. But nonetheless, how you show up and how you present yourself and how you carry yourself, to me, is a big thing. So take the initiative. Be proactive. Uh, let them know that you are there and you're a pro and you're excited about being there and you're looking forward to doing this game. And at the same time, you're going to, you, you're going to bust your tail. Nonetheless, you're probably going to kick a few calls. So to me, being able to take that initiative is a big thing. As much humanity as you can express uh, and, and bring to the table, uh, to me, is, is, is a big, big thing. Uh, next thing, I just, I just want to kind of touch on a few things. And I mentioned Ron Foxcroft before. And Ron, obviously, is a legendary official uh, in Canadian basketball and Hall of Famer and ref the Olympics. Ron uh, officiated many of my games uh, when I was the head coach at Niagara. And uh, not only is Ron a, a really good man, uh, he is a honest, hardworking official who made mistakes. But, you know, and I'd get, I'd, get, I'd get on his ass, and he's teed me up. And the last technical foul I ever got in my career, Ron gave to me. Uh, and uh, I chased him to the locker room at halftime, and the opposing team got two free throws to start the second half, and we came back and win and won. So I thank Ron for my last career win. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I always enjoyed having him because uh, he busted his tail. He came over with a good attitude and a smile, and you could talk to him, uh, and, and you, know, you, could, you could have a relationship with him. And to me, I, I think those are the best guys. I'm going to tell you a little story that uh, about an official who just passed away recently. He was a legendary official, uh, ref in the ACC, the Big East, Atlantic 10, the MAC, the league I coached in, uh, you know, Big 10. This guy worked major NCAA tournament games. He was a legend. His name was Mickey Crowley, a New York guy. And I'll never forget, I think it might have been my second year as the head coach at Niagara. And we're playing Loyola, Maryland. And we are in a four-overtime game. Now, if any of you have ever officiated a four-overtime game, uh, if you, I can tell you, coaching in a four-overtime game in a sold-out building, in an important game, and quite frankly, you know, there's always pressure to win. And as a young coach, you're always worried about getting fired. And uh, it, was a, it was an incredibly great game. It was an incredibly competitive game. And it was two evenly matched teams. We're playing at home. And Mickey's partner on the far end from my bench blows a call. Just blows a call. And excuse my French, but I go fucking nuts. So I'm going crazy. And I get the crowd riled up, and we're playing at home, and people are going crazy, and they're giving the ref hell, all this. Mickey Crowley walks down the court to the end of my bench, and I'm giving him shit as he walks by me, and he doesn't even acknowledge me. He walks down to the end of my bench to the baseline and puts his head down on the baseline. And he tells my trainer, Ray, he says, Ray, I've lost the contact. I can't find my contact. So he's got his head down on the baseline at my bench. Meanwhile, the call happened on the other end. So think of this, fans are going nuts. I'm going ballistic, tie loose, all this. My assistants are grabbing me, yada, yada, yada. Four overtime game. I'm sweating through my jacket. I look like a complete moron. So Mickey's got his head down. Now he's got the trainer. He's got our team doctor, a few of our managers, and there, a few of them are on the floor looking around. And he tells Ray, my trainer, he goes, get Jack down here right now. 
So I walk, he, Ray goes, Mickey wants to talk to you. So I walk down the end of the bench and Mickey goes to me, hey, Jack, great game tonight, huh? Look around, four overtime game. Your team's playing great. Loyola's playing great. You're coaching your ass off. Tom Snyder down the other end, he's coaching his ass off. What a great game. He goes, Jack, you've known me for a while, right? I said, yeah. He goes, have you ever known me to be a guy that would screw you over? I'm like, Mick. He goes, keep your head down. So I'm looking for the contact just like him. He goes, have you ever known me to be someone that would screw you over? I'm like, Mick, absolutely not. He goes, Jack, my partner, he kicked that call. Keep your head down. I got you. Keep looking for my contact. I got you. He goes, my partner kicked that call. Do you think he feels good about that right now? Do you think he feels good? Keep looking for my contact. Do you think he feels good right now about the fact that he kicked that call? I'm like, no. He goes, you should have been teched up for that outrageous display you just did. He goes, but we didn't tee you up. Do you, do you want to cost your team a win? I said, no. He goes, do you think my partner wants to cost you a game? I'm like, no. He goes, keep looking for the contact. He goes, good. If you deserve to win the game, you'll win the game. If you deserve to lose the game, you'll lose the game. By the way, Jack, I don't even wear a contact. And he points, and my ref, my trainer holds it up, and Mickey puts an imaginary contact back in his eye, and he walks out and administers play, and the last three minutes of the fourth overtime go on, and we end up pulling out a thrilling game in four overtimes. That's bedside manner. That's stage presence. That's having the ability to say, you know what? I'm going to use good judgment and good discernment. And life isn't black. Life isn't white. Life is gray. It's compromise. It's diplomacy. It's using good judgment. It's disarming people. It's having relationships rather than rebellion. So to me, I learned a lot that night from Mickey. And I, I, as I reflect on officials in the NBA, college, high school, the thing I look for in official is, is that ability. I mean, there are, there are officials that are tremendous in terms of the techni techniques and this and that, yada, yada, yada. And they, they can do all that stuff. But honestly, if you talk to coaches, if you talk to players, they deep down just want somebody that's going to bust their tail, have, have a little bit of the, the ability to engage with the coach and with the player. And you know what? Because people have, uh, honestly, I'm not kidding you, and I see it in the pros. People have gone absolutely out of their minds, okay? Uh, uh, believe me. And I look at this. People have gone nuts, okay? You're calling a grade school game, a high school game, a college game, whatever. The grade school and high school parents think their little Jane or their little Johnny is going to the WNBA or the NBA. The college players all think they're going to the NBA or WNBA. And the pro guys all think they should be making, uh, you know, $14 million instead of $7 million. So they all think they're getting screwed over. And the coach thinks he should be making $9 million instead of six, And he's hanging by a thread because if he doesn't win the game, he's getting fired. 
So you have fans going nuts. You got players going nuts. You got people just completely losing their minds. And you are in the middle of all that. I get it. And you hear me on TV. There'll be times I will get on an official. I will get on an official more about uh, just not being in the right position. That's okay. Uh, but more so uh, just, you know, not being balanced and, 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 and making sure that uh, you're calling the game in a way uh, that's, that's ultimately uh, – that is consistent. And to me, I, I think it's really difficult uh, to get through that. But the best games that I see officiated are the ones that kind of nobody knows they're even there. Nonetheless, there's not a lot of theatrics from coaches. There's not a lot of theatrics from players because they find ways during the game, before the game, uh, at halftime, before the second half starts, to kind of put people at ease with that bedside method. So to me, those are such important things uh, that jump off the page at me that really matter. And uh, I, I think there are so many, so many great, great officials out there. And there are so many officials that are young and inexperienced that need our help. And, you you know, if, if you're working a two-man crew or three-man crew, depending on the budgets and the, the level of play and all that, how do we help each other? How do we support each other? How do we have that sisterhood? How do we have that brotherhood? How do we create that ability uh, to help each other and have each other's back and at the same time be respectful of what the coaches and the players are trying to do as well? And on top of all that, uh, be able to, you know, particularly in a smaller environment where you're in a high school gym or a grade school gym, to be able to keep control of, of, the, of the building itself and not have to deal with a whack job parent or a whack job uh, person that's at the game. It's totally unrealistic. And those people exist. Been there, done that. I see them still. I see them in the NBA, uh, family members, uh, groupies, whatever the case may be, that think the sun rises and sets on this player. And uh, I think they got to get give, the, give themselves, uh, shake their heads a little bit and get with reality because, uh, you know, I know the difference between Mickey Mantle and Mickey Mouse. So you might say, hey, I'm a great player. And I'm like, no, you're not. You know, you're lucky you're out on the court right now and you have no right to complain. Now, if it's LeBron James or someone like that, they have the right to complain because they're really good as long as they do it respectfully. So I, I just think that that's kind of my shtick on it, and I just want to finish, and then I want to I want to take a question and answer. I'm happy to do that, but I just want you to reflect on this last thing I'm going to read to you. A good friend of mine, a uh, former coach, when I was hired as the head coach at Niagara, uh, would have been uh, October of 1989. Uh, came to my press conference, and he gave me this. I have it on a plaque here in my, this is my den at home. Uh, I have it on the wall here in my uh, den, my office here. And when I was coach at Niagara University, uh, I had it on, I, on the wall in my office there. My office, uh, when I went to Raptors, is the Scotiabank Arena or whatever road arena that I'm in. I have a, a mobile office now for a living. But uh, he gave me this. And he said, Jack, you're going to experience this in your career. You're going to experience this in your life. And every chance you walk by, just stop and look at it and reflect on it. So I want to read it to you because I think each and every one of you uh, will be able to relate to this, not only as an official, but more importantly as a person. Here we go. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's called Anyway. People are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Love them. Anyway, 
If you do good, people will accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good. Anyway. If you're successful, you win true, false friends and true enemies. Succeed. Anyway. The good you do today will be forgotten tomorrow. Do good. Anyway. Honesty and frankness make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank. Anyway. People favor underdogs, but really only follow top dogs. Root for some underdogs. Anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build. Anyway. People really need help, but may attack you if you try to help them. Help people. Anyway. Give the world the best that you have, and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best that you have anyway. I think that in a lot of ways in our professions and our love of that orange bull, and I can't thank that orange bull enough. Uh, when I was seven years old, I started playing. Here I am, 50, 57 years old now. And for 50 years, I fell in love with that bull as a kid. And I've had two careers in this business, uh, one as a coach and, uh, and now as a broadcaster after being a lousy player. Uh, but nonetheless, I love that sport. And each and every one of you love this sport. And the word we need more of is sportsmanship. And it goes back to what I said earlier. Rules without relationships equal rebellion. Rules with relationships equal respect and results. So let's do a better job of creating better bonds, a little bit better relationships. Let's set the tone. Let's be proactive. And let's create an environment as best as we can of sportsmanship. And to me, it can be done. It is done. And the best officials do it. The best coaches get their players to play that way. And the best players carry themselves that way. And to me, uh, it's an idealistic pie-in-the-sky goal because there will always be whack jobs out there. But nonetheless, the better job we do, the less we can uh, – you know, we can control that as best as we can. And we have to back each other up as, as a basketball community. So uh, with that being said, as I said, if I say one thing that you can reflect on that helps you be a little bit better, I've done my job. If I say more than one thing, again, we've witnessed a miracle. But nonetheless, I'm happy to be with you tonight. And uh, I'm more than happy to take a few questions before uh, each of you, each of us kind of gets on with our Monday evening. Uh, but thank you again for having me. And uh, I look forward in the future to, to helping. Uh, I, Rick and I have been having some discussions about a few projects. And uh, I look forward to being of assistance to uh, what you're trying to get accomplished. Thank you. Great. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Jack. And we do have a series of questions in the chat box, and I'll probably pick through uh, four or five and toss them your way. I'm just going to let you swallow your drink and catch your breath. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty amazed that you can uh, talk as rapidly as you do without breathing in between. So I'm not, <laughs> sure if that's a, I'm not sure if that's an old Niagara trick or where that comes from. No, it's, um, it's it's called being a fast talk in New Yorker. So uh, okay. you got you got to talk fast. It's survival to finish. It's a doggy dog world out, world out there. So, well, I I did have the pleasure of uh, uh, meeting Mickey Crowley a couple of times, and Mickey didn't talk quite as fast. And I can promise you, as you know, Mickey Crowley would not have been at all concerned about your language, whether you consider it French or not. That would not have bothered him. In <laughs> So the first question is about stage presence, and you identified the importance of stage presence or what we'll call court presence for most times. Um, the, the question suggests that it's even more important for a young female official. 
And so is there, is there anything that you can identify um, for the young female officials that would help them strike a balance between the relationship building and gaining the respect without crossing the line and appearing like an authority figure? I, I think it's confidence. I really do. I think walking in uh, and carrying yourself with confidence that, you know what, I'm going to do a good job for you tonight. And walking in and just having that confidence that I know I'm, I'm perfectly imperfect. Yes, I'm perfectly imperfect. But man, oh man, nobody in this, nobody right here, right now is going to do a better job and work harder than me tonight. So I think you walk in there. I wouldn't say with a, a strut, but walk in with that, that confidence that, you know what, I'm ready to meet the moment. I'm ready. And, and in a way that uh, preserves the authority of your job and at the same time presents you in a way uh, to say, hey, look, I'm here and I'm going to work my tail off for you tonight. And uh, I, I'm going to do uh, I'm going to I'm going to bring it, you know, and. and I just ask for your uh, cooperation because I might kick a call or two here, but I'm going to, I'm going to be out there. I'm going to work my tail off for you and your team. And I'm going to work my tail off for uh, the other coach and his team. And, and so I, I, I think it's, I, I don't know if there's a difference, honestly, I don't, I don't see any difference between a, a female official walking in and a male official. I don't care about that. I care about, good officiating period and we have some wonderful uh ladies that are officiating now in the nba that are terrific uh we have some guys that are lousy <laughs> uh there's good there's bad i don't really see that much of a difference we're people period uh, and and shame on a coach or shame on a player uh that makes a judgment based upon someone's gender i think that's a complete that I'm not for that whatsoever. I just think it, no matter who you are, uh, I think it, it, it's coming in and carrying yourself uh, in a way that uh, presents that you're prepared, you're confident, uh, you're going to be firm yet fair, and you're going to be uh, someone that uh, people can approach and speak to rather than feel intimidated by it. And w which leads to a reply. Great, thank you. So the next question that uh, I've got on the chat board here that I'm going to ask is, do you think that officials are held to a higher standard than coaches and players in terms of their behavior and their composure? Well, uh, I would say, and you might not like this, but I think they have to be. Uh, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not going to get into the whole police thing. Uh, it, we don't have enough time for me to cover all that. But I've actually, I've spoken about all the issues right now, you know, obviously in the United States, and I've used the rules without re relationships thing. And that's a big part of the problem uh, with, with uh, policing right now. It's a difficult thing. Uh, the better police, uh, Police, per, police uh, officer uh, has those gifts, has those, has that bedside manner and that presence that they can diffuse things. But I think we look at our leaders, we look at our uh, law enforcement, we look at our officials uh, to create an environment of sportsmanship, fair play. Uh, in, in, in a spirit of, 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 you know, just the reason why we love the sport. So, yeah, I think there are times where coaches act out and uh, they shouldn't do that. They cross a line. I think players act out. Uh, I, as I said before, uh, what I want to be, I'm not being, I'm, I'm not being a wise guy here, would I want to be an official uh, today with all these crazy people out there that think their little Jane and their little Johnny is the next uh, 
great player? No, I wouldn't want to deal with it. I throw everybody out. <laughs> you guys are you guys and gals are a lot more patient than I am. I wouldn't put up with this bullshit. Uh, but nonetheless, you have to. Uh, but I, I I really think it's it's uh, it's sad. But yeah, I, I would say that you have to be the adult in the room, and as much, because sometimes uh, the, the players act immaturely, and sometimes the coaches act. Uh, in a, in a spoiled, immature way as well. Uh, you're not going to get a recall. And I've coached against coaches that think they deserve every call. And you have a lot of egomaniacs out there that have a walk into a building. And I used to deal, deal with this all the time as a young coach when you're coaching against a name coach with a big reputation and that walks in with a lot of arrogance and just thinks that the three refs are supposed to kiss his ring and he gets every call. And there were a few times I would tell the, the I would tell the coach down the other end to go fuck himself, uh, excuse my French, but I would tell him to fuck off because you're not going to get every call. And I'm going to battle my ass off and I'm going to uh, coach your team and I'll coach mine and stop whining down the other end and stop being so arrogant. You know, and, and trying to put him on his heels. You know, he's trying to put the refs on his he on their heels. I'm going to put his ass on his heels. So, uh, you know, but you un unfortunately, I think the officials have to be the adults because there were times I got out of hand, and there were times players get out of hand. Great. So, <laughs> Jack, in your in your role with the NBA Rules Advisory Committee, do you think the NBA and the international games will continue to move closer together in terms of rules and, and get to a stage where there's greater similarities than there is today? I think we're getting there. Uh, we're not there yet. I'd like to see more of that. Uh, I, I really do. I think that, you know, the FIBA element and the NBA element, uh, WNBA, NCA, you know, the international element, I'd like to see more and more uniformity. I'll say this, though. Um, I, uh, I'm seeing it in the NBA, seeing it in college. I, I, I would like to, <laughs> I'd like to see the three point line move back a little more at every level. And the reason I say that is there's too much emphasis on that shot and there's not enough emphasis on other things. And the bean counters, the analytics people have put such value on that that it's taken away a lot of the beauty and the flow of cutting, screening, uh, five is one, creating a nice shot. And now it's all just draw, kick, swing, and you get a shot, which is fine. But uh, I, I'd And I think it would be a better game to officiate because it opens things up a little bit more and there's more fluidity to it. Uh, I think the more space... I'd love to see uh, the I'd, I'd love. I don't think the court needs to be lengthened. When I look in the NBA, I'd like to see it widen two or three feet on both sides. I don't think that'll ever happen because they're not going to give up the Gucci seats. But who knows after what we're going through in the pandemic, where people are going to be sitting? So maybe that's a possibility. And there's also such an emphasis on the corner three that uh, guys are every single NBA game I call, every game I watch. Uh, there's there's at least two or three times during a game a guy's getting called for stepping on the sideline because they're all trying to run to that corner. So those would be a few things I'd like to see change. But uh, yeah, I'd like I'd like to see a little bit more uniformity. Uh, but nonetheless, I think in, in every country, in every level, there are better teams, better players, better coaches, better refs, and. Uh, as much as we try to make everything uniform, uh, I, I still think uh, it's hard to get everything on a balance, uh, even Stephen Love. Jack, if we can, if you're okay, we'll try two more questions. And, and That's we'll, great. No problem. I'm happy to. So as a sportscaster or you're in, in your role as a broadcaster, do you find it difficult to re remain neutral when commenting uh, about a call an official has made? 
Uh, yeah, there are times. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Do I want the Raptors to win or lose? I'd rather they win than lose. Uh, now, am I a shill? No, I don't think I am. I think anyone who listens to me, uh, I feel like I'm fair, I'm balanced. Uh, when the other team makes a good play, uh, I compliment it. When the Raptors don't make a good play, uh, I'm also, uh, you know, candid and frank about the fact that they have to do something better. Uh, you know, so I feel like I'm pretty balanced. Uh, I, you know, and, you know, obviously there are times where people get angry with me because they feel like I'm too much of a homer. And then there are people that are angry with me that I'm too critical of the Raptors. Well, if I'm if, if people are saying that on both sides, that means I'm doing my job. Uh, that I'm, there are times that I'm uh, effusive in my praise, deservedly so if it's there. And there are other times I'm critical. And believe me, uh, there are people that I have to deal with that there are times where they get really pissed off at me. And they don't realize that, hey, hey by the way, don't, you don't remember uh, that I said something really nice about you a day before, but they have short memories because it's a one-way street. They want it all the time. And that can't happen that way. So I, I feel like I'm as balanced and as fair as I can possibly be. And at the same time, I feel I'm that way uh, when I observe officials. Uh, there are times where I pounce on them and maybe go too hard on them. Then there are other times uh, I back off uh, and, you know, they'll make a call against the Raptors. That was the right call for the other team. And I'll say, hey, they got it right. Uh, so uh, you do the best you can. Am I perfect? No. I'm the furthest thing from it. And I am the furthest thing from scripted. So there are times I probably shoot from the hip too much. Uh, you know, you know, what's the definition of an Irishman? Uh, you, your heart, your heart knows before your brain. And a lot of times you think with your heart rather than your brain. Uh, I've tried as I've gotten older to uh, kind of give both uh, some degree of responsibility in the decision. But there are probably too many times I allow my heart uh, to get in the way of it. So I'll shoot from the hip and react to something. But if I, if I learn that I kicked it, I try to admit it uh, because that's why they put erases on pencils. And that's why officials are out there busting their tail. And I walk over before every game uh, that I do. I walk right out on the court and I walk over and shake the hands of the three officials and always say hello and ask them, you know, where they came from, where their last game was, where they're going next. A lot of them I know very well and ask, you know, about their family or whatever the case may be. And overwhelmingly, I think I'm fair. Uh, do I, again, do I lose it once in a while? Yeah. I also got to tell you, this is show business. This is not, uh, I'm not splitting the atom. I'm not finding a cure for some, uh, some disease. I am not. Uh, I'm not that smart. Uh, I'm in the sports business. Uh, and part of sports is entertainment. Uh, so I try to have fun. Uh, and, you know, the company, one of the companies I work for, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, MLSE, E is for entertainment. Uh, if you look at ESPN, which is a part owner of TSN, it's the Entertainment and Sports Network. So, uh it's show business, and we're all part of the show business. And unfortunately, today, more than ever, the sports business has become sports entertainment. Uh, and a, a lot of times, our fans don't even pay attention to the games because they all got their heads buried in, the, in their cell phones. Uh, but to me, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that I, I think if you're fair, if you're prepared, if you're honest, if you're a truth teller, uh, and if you're fair to all sides, good things happen. Well, that, that's excellent, Jack. I, I said we'd bring one more question, but I think in fairness, you answered the next three questions in, in that last answer and <laughs> wrapped them all together. So I'll, that take was, one, I'll, do one, I'll do one more. What, what do you got? Give me another one. 
Okay, I, I I will ask it, and I and I promised I would stay away from names, but I but we'll go there. I apologize. I just got to roll up in the roll up in the screen here. Um, is there a current NBA official who you think gets the benefit of the doubt more than others around call selection just because of the way they carry themselves or the way they've developed their relationships with the players and the coaches? Yeah, I would say Zach Zarba. Uh, now, Zach, Zach's a Brooklyn guy like me, so automatically he's from Brooklyn. I love him. But Zach has, Zach has to me, he's a young official. Uh, and Zach's done big games. He's done the NBA Finals. I mean, he's a he's one of our better officials. Uh, he's got stage presence. He carries himself the right way. He looks good. He has wonderful bedside map. He knows everybody by their first name. Uh, he gives eye contact. You know, back then, I don't know what's going to be the future. He'd give you a good, firm handshake, look you in the eye, um, sense of humor. Uh, he's got just a nice way about him. And he disarms you with uh, a nice, just nice temperament. And when I reflect on a guy like Dick Bavetta, a Brooklyn guy, by the way, as well, and Dick had great bedside manner. Uh, was Dick the best official in the NBA? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But you know what? Most coaches, most players didn't mind having Dick on the game because he handled himself the right way. You could talk to him. And he busted his tail, and he was prepared to do the game. And when he had to be tough and when he had to talk you down and say, that's enough, he did it. And I look at a guy like Mickey Crowley. I think of a guy the same way. So I think Zach has that. I think he has a great technical knowledge of the game. His mechanics are good. He's convincing when he makes a call. And that's all part of the best actresses, the best actors have it. It's, uh, it, you know, it's just, there's just certain elements that the great ones have. And, uh, you know, what do we say? Uh, when, I, when I would watch a, a great player, I would say that player ch jumps off the page at me. And I think the better officials, how they carry themselves, it jumps. And I think Zach is one of our best young officials uh, in the league. And, and I'm happy for him because he's a generally nice person. And we have so many great young officials and the challenge we have in the NBA right now, and I'm not going to kid you, and uh, we had a big problem a few years ago. I think it's gotten better the last few years. Uh, you know, but players acting out, players acting, quite frankly, in a, in a totally unprofessional way. Uh, coaches, some of them acting in an unprofessional way. But I think he was the problem. Part of the problem was the NBA. Uh, it, I've said it. Uh, why are we letting our best older officials retire? Cut down their schedule, pay them more money, and let's keep them around. I mean, why do we add the third official? I, when I was coaching, I started off, we had two officials. Now we have three. Well, guess what? That means you don't have to run as much. Uh, you know, see, maybe you lose your wheels a little bit, but if you still have great judgment and bedside manner and stage presence and, and, and the ability under rapid fire decisions to be a wartime general rather than a peacetime general, even if you've lost a half step or a step because you're a little older, you can still deal with all the conflict related issues and the egos of the coaches and the egos of the players and let the younger officials, you know, you're there with them. But a lot of those guys retired. And now we're asking our second guy to become the first the third to become the second, and the novice, the young official, to move in that third spot, and a lot of times you have issues. Now, at the level that each and every one of you, and you all referee at different levels, you can all relate to what I'm talking about because on a nightly basis, your partner or partners might be uh, A quality, they might be a C quality. But nonetheless, you got to create a team and you got to get the calls right. So 
Uh, but I, I think we're getting better as a league with that. Uh, but it's a transition period. And I think, uh, I think, the, I think the, uh, but uh, my, my challenge to the NBA has been though, Hey, you know what? Uh, you can't be robots. You gotta, you gotta step out of your comfort zone and uh, get, you know, that you're all caught up in your mechanics and this, that, the other thing. And you gotta have, you gotta be able to do both. You gotta not only know the rules and look good calling it, uh, you gotta be able to deal with a guy making $24 million and, Giving you shit, and how do you deal with that? You know, and 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 be able to have a a, a partnership and a collaborative uh, relationship on the floor that uh, creates sportsmanship, that creates a, a good experience for everybody involved. And again, it's a it's a perfectly imperfect situation. Uh, I admire and respect the job each and every one of you do. Uh, and as I said before, it's difficult being an authority figure these days. Uh, and, and, you know, there's always people that uh, have conspiracy theories and are second guessing you. And look, and I say this all the time, and I get this question. I think the NBA officials screw the Raptors over because they're the only Canadian team in the NBA. There's an anti Canadian bias. Well, guess what? When I go to Salt Lake City, they think they're getting screwed. When I go to Charlotte, their fans think they're getting screwed. You know, when I go to uh, Portland, their fans think they're getting screwed. So everywhere you go, and it's the same way in broadcasting, you're either too much of a homer or you're, you're too much of a guy that's piling on. You can't win. But all you can do is your best. And that ain't easy. Uh, better you have the job than I have. <laughs> Because the job I have, everyone thinks they can do it. But then when you put a microphone in front of their face, they can't put two sentences together because it's live action. And I'm, I'm a big believer. People say, hey, let's rehearse this. I'm like, uh, do you want to know the questions that we're going to ask you? I'm like, I need to be fired. You need to fire me. If I can't answer the questions you throw at me, I don't deserve my job. I'm not prepared. I don't want to rehearse. I like the pressure of the red light coming on. Show biz. Here we go. Let's do it. Because my job's, my job's to be prepared before we start. And same as each and every one of you. As much uh, as, as it's pressure, there ain't nothing like it. Call on a big game. And the pressure of that next play, uh, you love it. And you get in your car after the game and you, you, you think about, uh, you know, what goes right, what goes wrong in the game. And there's a lot of things that you think about. But nonetheless, uh, as long as you gave it your best shot. But thank you so much for having me on tonight. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and. A, I look forward down the road to meeting you in person, maybe sometime down the road if you have a conference or whatever. I know, Rick, we're going to work on a few things uh, to try to help your cause a little bit. And uh, I hope uh, hope to see you again. I hope to see basketball, lots of it. And uh, most importantly, uh, for each and every one of you, uh, be safe, be well, and uh, look forward to seeing you on the other side when we come out of this. So thank you, Jack. I greatly appreciate you giving us an hour of your best. And looking at some of the comments in the uh, in the chat room, um, I can certainly tell that you're not the only people, the only person on the call that likes Brooklyn people. There's a few other people that said they're good with people from Brooklyn as well. So thank you very much, um, Rick Parnum. Any uh, any closing words, Jack? It's it was a pleasure to listen to you tonight. Uh, as always, um, your insight is invaluable to us. Um, I know I appreciate listening to the background of the passion that you have while watching a Raptor game. And I hope that some of that got infused to our crew that were uh, part of this call tonight. Um, one thing I could ask you, Jack, I saw it in the chat room a couple of times is, um, would you be able to take a picture of that great poem 
that you shared with us tonight. Um, send it along to me, and then I can get it in the hands of Mike and Rika. Yes. Uh, it, it touched Rick. so many people in the in the chat. So yeah, no problem, Rick. I will I will send that along to you. Uh, I think I have it saved in my phone. Other, if I don't, I'll take a picture of it and send it to you in the next five minutes. Awesome. That would be wonderful. And Jack, same to you on the best wishes. Uh, hopefully that border opens up at some point. We can get around to golf in and um, a, a enjoy some time together in person. And so. by the way, the most important thing, Rick, go Bills, right? Go, Rick's a big, Rick's go a big Bills. Go Bills. Bills fan. There we go. <laughs> Talking proud. 